Welcome. I'm Chris Martinson, and this is Peak Prosperity. Hello, everyone. Chris Martinson here of Peak Prosperity, and we're here with another Featured Voices podcast. It's September 2nd, 2020. And as you know, I, I talk a lot about COVID. Maybe that's how you know me. But the people who've been following me for a long time know that I'm talking about the economy and financial issues a lot. And COVID came along, and fortunately, I had this background in science to be able to help decode that. Well, I'm really more interested in decoding uh, finance and economic matters because those are the ones that impact all of us. I think that we're facing one of the most difficult, if not dangerous, periods uh, ever because of all the money printing Federal Reserve is doing. And I wrote a piece about a year ago, way before COVID, of course, and any inkling of it that said that I thought we were going to start in on one of the largest back to the land movements in history. And part of the reason for that was I thought, well, if the whole trend up to now is people flooding into cities, what if that ever reversed? And it was centered around my own personal property search. You know, I was going out with Evie and we're looking for properties and we were looking for properties with more than five acres. We were looking in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, two whole states. We knew every property. And by the time we whittled them down for our characteristics, there were about 30 uh, that could have satisfied our needs. And of those, we really liked five. And all of a sudden I ran into the math and I was like, what if 0.1% of people in Boston were in competition with me for those properties? And the answer is there would have been tens of thousands of people looking for those same five properties. Uh, and it would have been a much more difficult search. So that's what I thought I saw coming. COVID happens. Now everything's upside down and crazy. And I know people who are both paralyzed about the idea of moving or desperate to move. Lots of people making that transition. So the question comes, we're really are we in the real estate story? And there's nobody better to talk to us about that than somebody who's been in the business a long time, does his homework, knows his math, is a great guy. Uh, I can count him as a friend. I'm really happy to welcome to the program, Ken McElroy. Ken, great to have you here with us. Chris, great seeing you, man. Really awesome. I love your stuff. As you know, we've traveled all over the world together. Um, and, um, you know, you helped me look at my real estate markets a little bit differently with like you said, the science and the math behind it all. And it certainly helped us in our journey. Um, so thank you. It's been great. Yeah, I know at one point you, you have a, an, an investor meeting that you hold because you run uh, very significant real estate investments. And you have investors come in and, and you're managing those uh, investments for them. I remember one year you gave silver to those participants. Maybe yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> we, we have every year, actually. Yeah, so we have, we have about 1,500 high net worth investors and we have just north of a billion dollars worth of real estate right now. Uh, mostly apartments, but uh, self-storage, office, land development. And, um, you know, and then we dabble in the single family a little bit. But, um, yeah, so we bring all those investors in and they're from all different walks of life. And, you know, I just started doing that, uh, the print our own silver with our own logo on it. And we've been doing that at our employee events, our investor events. And now that's turned into be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, so, so I, I love that you're doing that. And uh, I, I love that, that you even credit even partially that Adam and I had something to do with that. You know what, I'm just going to share my screen here um, real quick. Uh, because there was, um, let me see if I can pull this up. Oh, yeah. You remember oh, this? Yeah. Yes, the Tom car. Yeah, so that's Adam in the back, and, and uh, that's you in the front, and we're all strapped in, and these Tom cars, what an amazing thing. This was a, a day where you, you uh, signed us up, and we went out into the deserts around Sedona. There's Adam and I, and uh, we're much younger in this. It's only 2015, but geez, the years, <laughs> have, years <laughs> have piled up. Yeah, there we were riding around, and uh, you took us to a, a place that you had up in Sedona Canyon, um, and... Uh, I don't know if you still have that, but what an amazing yep. spot you found there. And uh, we just had a grand time. You showed us a wonderful time. And that Tom Carr experience was uh, really just amazing to uh, Look ride. At, oh, you got a a AK in there too. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my buddy AK. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that was just a little trip down memory lane, but that was, uh, yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. Yep. We so, still, we still own that resort and uh, you know, we bought it cause it was, uh, had water rights and yep. uh, you know, as you know, we went up there, you kind of helped us. How do we get off the grid there? And so we're, we're almost there, man. It's farm to table and um, all the water so far. And, and, and um, so it's been, it's been a wonderful experience. Yeah. And, and uh, based on that, I actually, uh, we can talk about it some other time, but I'm working on a project, which is starting from slightly more, uh, we're converting a residential place into a full 
a full space where people can come, but uh, it's going to be around sustainability and people can come and rent a cabin, but, but also maybe learn how to pick their own food out of a garden or start a fire for the first time or whatever they're here to do. Um, but actually started a, a whole real estate deal in, in large measure because of meeting people like you and other people on the real estate crews and all of that. So um, yeah, thank you very much for my, my own education and, uh, and uh, ability to go forward with a syndicated real estate deal. Yeah. Hey, my, it's my pleasure, man. I, I, you know, I think, uh, honestly, you, you know, all this, all your teachings roll very well into, you know, that, that I always think of that, that tier, you know, tier one, tier two, tier three. And, you know, in fact, um, I actually, uh, referred to it in one of my YouTube videos, um, that I did during this pandemic. And I said, my buddy, Chris Martinson, he says, you know, the tier three, the, you know, the, the paper, uh, you know, is the most dangerous. And I still believe that. And it was a great visual for me to see, you know, you need to be sticking down to the resource category, the land, you know, the hard assets, and that's going to show up here in the next, you know, three to five years for sure. Well, I want to, I want to go there and talk about it because uh, obviously COVID comes along and I'd love to hear about your own pandemic experiences. It's changed all of our lives. Um, but in honesty, it didn't cause any of the things we're seeing. It certainly put some afterburners on, you know, strapped a couple rockets on. But as far as I can tell, you know, everything was sort of already too extended, too much printing, too much funny money, even before COVID came along. And that, of course, just gave air cover for the Federal Reserve to, to print more and more and more. And, and honestly, they don't have a plan, Ken. They don't, they don't, they, they're like, well, print and then dot, dot, dot. They can't fill in the ellipse in that sentence. You know, they don't know. I don't think they have a plan. Their plan is to keep printing and hope it all works out. And um, if it does, great. But if it doesn't, look out below, right? So um, yeah. that's where I that's think if tangible assets make the most sense in this story. Real estate is the most tangible of them all when you get right down to it, as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, well, you know, I, when I talk about COVID, obviously it's been a big deal. We have 250 employees, 10,000 tenants and lots of properties and lots of management around all those things. And, and so we've had to do all the PPE, the PPP, the EIDL, the, you, know, you know, everything. And we're, you know, it's been a really interesting ops, you know, operational part for our company in the last, uh, you know, three or four months. Um, but I call COVID an accelerator because I, I really believe what it did is it took things like, like my friends are in the retail market or in the mall space. It just basically pushed them right out, you yeah. know, because yeah. they were already in big trouble with the direct to consumer stuff with Amazon and you know now Walmart's uh, you know and, and Target's uh, everybody's trying to catch up to to Amazon and, and and so those those retailers and those service businesses were already in trouble you know when people buy stuff they you know they're at home and they order it in a couple of minutes and and then they go do what they they're going to do and it shows up on their door so that was already in motion and so it just kind of washed it out you know yep. Yep. And I'm, I'm thankful to the real estate radio guys, uh, Robert Helms and Russ Gray, for, for pointing out to me that real estate is not an asset class. It's many different asset classes. So you just mentioned, you know, one, one aspect of it. So I want to be real clear when we're talking real estate. It's not like we're talking about one thing because obviously malls would be a very different investment than uh, industrial space versus apartments versus raw That's land, right. all of that. Right. So That's exactly right. You know, I say, I go, you know, when they talk about residential, I go, okay, so is that condo? Is it entry level? Is it high end custom? You know, you know, there's that's just residential, and there's of course other categories, and you know, on, and then you've got self storage, industrial, retail. You know, the the malls, which is really which is really retail, multifamily. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in land development, and so they do it. They everybody, you know, as you know, they put it in one category. But the other thing is, is they they do that with vacancy rates, occupancy rates, rents, rent growth, you know, they're, they're like, well, what's the occupancy? Well, it's 96% in the nation. Well, you know, it might be 75% in Detroit, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then there's different areas of Detroit, for example, that might be worse than others and better than others. And so it, it's a very localized uh, business. And, um, you know, you really make your money by having knowledge of each individual submarket. Yeah, well said. So, so how has it been uh, for you? I, I know that I just heard that the CDC is thinking of uh, yeah. allowing people to skip rent payments. I'm not sure where that authority came from, but I'm sure that impacts you. So, so how, how, how do things look in your space? 
Yeah. So, well, well a few things. One, um, you know, we'll, well, so we're in the multifamily space. We have just under 10,000 apartments and uh, we have them throughout Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona. And, you know, so we have, it depends on the demographic of the apartment building itself. So our senior stuff, as you can imagine, they're kind of unplugged from all this. They're getting their checks. They're good. Uh, we were literally 100% collected before, we're 100% collected after. Um, anybody that's been in the hospitality sector, you know, so we have properties that are kind of near those, um, they're in a little bit more trouble. Anything that has to do with the airlines, uh, for example, airline mechanics and pilots and those kinds of things, trouble. Uh, we've had a little disruption around our student housing because of the Zoom, you, you, know, uh, the, you know, it's not a direct experience anymore. So uh, every property has been a little bit different. Every market's been a little bit different. Uh, you know, I would, I would say uh, the, 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 the team has really uh, just been incredible. Our, our team has just been incredible. You know, we're collecting in the 90s, uh, the mid, mid to high 90s uh, on most properties with the exception of a couple. And um, so we're in pretty good shape as a company, but I think it has largely to do with where we bought the properties and we're, we're a little bit more of a high end, uh, you know, uh, landlords than, you know, and most of our stuff's newer, you know, we're a builder too. So we build our own and uh, you know, so the demographic and, and we know they're, uh, they have pretty good credit, pretty good savings, you know, before they move in, but uh, they're certainly impacted, man. I mean, we put them into three buckets, Chris. We said, okay, bucket one was they came in and paid. No problem. Bucket two was, you know, we are um, very concerned. We want to work with you. And we set up what's called a, a PTP program, which is a promise to pay program. And that was bucket two. And there was a lot, thousands of people in that category. And then the next category were, Hey, uh, you know, the president said we don't have to pay rent. So we're not going to, And by the way, we're not going to communicate with you at all. So those are kind of the three buckets. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so really most of our effort was in that last bucket. And, um, you know, uh, believe it or not, it wasn't that many, it was, you know, in the hundreds of, of people that just chose to, you know, not communicate, move out, whatever, skip. Uh, but then you throw the COVID thing on there, you know, we had residents with COVID, we have employees with COVID, mm -hmm. you, you know, you have all that as well, just to add to the complexity of it all. Uh, but we had to imagine this, we had to take our whole company in March and go from online tours to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, personal tours to online tours and, um, and all hundred uh, percent automated rent collection. So we had to do, we did all that in, in, in just a, a couple of weeks. And um, so we've done pretty well, but, but a lot of my friends are not doing so well, you know, uh, depending on the, again, the, the properties that they have. I have a lot of friends in retail and, um, you know, a lot of friends in, in land development and things like that. And the lending industry and all that stuff is, is obviously a bit disrupted. Yeah, and it, it's certainly a, a very complex uh, business to run. And, and uh, just so people don't think you just sort of airlifted and dropped in to your current position. I love your origin story. Uh, could you just tell us real quick about how you got started in this whole business? Yeah, yeah, I was completely lucky. Uh, I mean, I, I, my, uh, my buddy asked me while I was in college if I would manage an apartment community, uh, you know, and I was, I was racking up student debt and trying to get through school. My, my parents did not graduate from uh, high school. And so, you know, me being in college was a big thing. I was racking up the student loans at the time, at the, but uh, they were much different then, but I needed them. And um, he said, hey, you know, would you take over the 60 unit apartment building in Seattle, Washington? I said, how hard can that be? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so I moved in to this place. I go, what does it pay? He's like free rent and 300 a month. And I'm like, done, you know, because yeah. I was like free rent. Was, yeah, but then it, it's just I was like, oh, my gosh, like rent collection and then turning the units and, you know, and then just all the individual behaviors of all the people that lived there it was just it was a, it was really the first time I had a massive education. And so after about a few months of just busting my butt, um, I had a, a construction background. So I was turning units, painting units, cleaning units, doing the maintenance. And I just was doing it all, you know, because I thought, oh, this is what you're supposed to do. I didn't realize you can, you know, vend it out. So the, the owner comes in and he's like, I don't know how you got our property so full. 
Um, you know, but thank you. This is great. And I handed him, you know, cause back then, you know, uh, you know, he would come and I would turn over the deposits to him. He'd run them to the bank. And I was like, I am on the wrong side of the desk here. <laughs> and uh, that was it for me. I'm, I'm not kidding. I was like, you know, I saw the numbers once the property was run well and full and it's property management really is common sense. And so I was grateful. And I got in the property management business. I started managing bigger properties, more properties, all up and down the, um, basically from Can uh, in Northern, Northern Washington, uh, basically the Canadian border, all the way down through Oregon and even some of the California. And I did that for about eight, nine years. And then I just started my own firm and, uh, you know, started a, a fee management uh, company. And then I started buying, you know, single families. And uh, my first investment was 160 grand. I used my own cash. Second mm -hmm. one uh, was a little bit more. I used my own cash. And then guess what? I was out of cash. So I was like, okay, now I'm going to have to figure out, I still am finding deals and they cash flowed, but now I'm going to have to figure out how do I get the money? And that's when I learned how to syndicate and put, you know, groups together and find people that um, had confidence in me. Um, and so, and then, you know, so I started small with a two bedroom, two bath and just grew from there. And, you know, now we have uh, like, uh, oh, just uh, right around a billion dollars worth of assets. We've had much more than that. We sold a bunch in 2019, sold a couple hundred million worth, which is good timing, I guess, uh, in hindsight. But, um, but you know, I'm a, I'm a cycle guy, Chris, and that's why I loved hanging out with you and Adam. I, I really am. I, I, you know, you know, it's hard when, when everybody's doing, you know, like there's a frenzy over things. People have a, you know, the herd mentality that they want to go by now, you know, they believe that they have to now. And, and I, I look at numbers, you know, just like you, and I'm like, well, I'm going to sell now and I've made enough. So maybe it goes higher. Great for the next guy. But if it doesn't, you know, I'll be there for, you know, when it comes back down. And that's what Ross uh, McAllister and I have done the whole time. So we've been buying in the cycles and, and we actually haven't really bought a lot in the last two years because, you know, a lot of new money came in and pushed it up. Interest rates went down. And, you know, when I'm talking about new money, I'm talking private equity, big institutional equity, Black, Blackstone, Goldman, you know, giving all kinds of people money to buy apartments and mm -hmm. just kept that, you know, kept it going. And our returns were going down. So Ross and I decided not to buy. We started building. We were buying land and building. And, um, you know, it's always based on those syndicators are basing, they're usually, they're, they're saying they're, it's based on a value add. And so, you know, they're basing on next year being better than, than the current year. And that's not a bad strategy when the fundamentals are there, but we felt like it was peaking. Uh, actually, I thought, I actually, you know, COVID, like I said, it just kind of made it happen. But we were close already, I believe on a lot of levels uh, on, on the market peaking. Yeah, and, and, and if people don't remember, it was in September of 2019, months before any inkling of COVID could have possibly come out, that the Federal Reserve was busy shoveling money into markets for our, you know, bailing out arcane corners of, of the financial system. Uh, you know, and these were all like really highly complicated, speculative uh, you know, things run by big firms. Uh, the, the, they don't actually produce anything again. <laughs> These are firms that make oh. money using money and that's the end of that. Nobody gets housed. Nobody has a better deal. You know, they don't, all of that. But they, they got in trouble and the Fed started bailing them out. So you could feel the creaking and the groaning, you know. And the Fed had to put $500 billion in even before COVID came anywhere near the doorway. And then it did. And then, you know, they just threw more on there. Um, I'm, a, I'm sort of a fundamental guy. I don't think that you can print your way to prosperity. It's sort of part of our tagline, <laughs> peak prosperity. Yeah. Um, but I wanted people to hear your background because you, you have this deep experience. This isn't your first rodeo. Maybe you've seen a cycle or two in the past. You now have a, a, a really a, a very viral even a YouTube video out that's talking about where you think that this cycle's coming. As we just mentioned, the backstory was it was already on the way here. COVID's maybe accelerated that. It maybe got a little delayed because of all this stimulus money and people getting some checks and that and all this. But what? Why don't you lay that, that theory out for us there? What do you got? What are you working on here? Sure. Well, I, I look at things like you. I, I mean, you know, like one of the things I learned from you and Adam is, is, you know, there are definitely markers and there are signs. There are things that are happening that for whatever reason, people just ignore, uh, you know, and, and so, 
obviously we, the first thing we watched was all the unemployment numbers go up. And the truth is we didn't know when things were going to reopen, you know, and then they came out with the PPP and all the cares and all that money. And that kind of kept a lot of the businesses going. Um, and, and, but there was a lot of businesses. I had a lot of friends. If you had over 500 employees, they didn't get any money. And so, you know, and so, you know, you got to take a look at, you know, what's happened when a lot of these businesses were, are fighting for their lives right now, financially, you, you know, the, the restaurants that maybe sat a hundred are now seating 50, uh, you know, gyms that, you know, had all these members, you know, all these businesses that are, you know, they're slowly going through uh, massive change and mass, massive behavior change. And, and so you're looking at all that. And then the people that are working in all those places, they got the $600 a week. You know, and, um, and, you know, my friends are going, you know, I'm trying to reopen, but now, you know, I can't get a, a dental tech to come work for me because I was paying them 18 an hour and, you know, they're getting 20 by sitting at home. And so there was all of that. And so that just eliminated. And so it's all been propped up. And I read um, recently that 25% of America right now is being funded by government stimulus. 25%? I don't know if that. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, wow. And so, so I started digging into the numbers and, you know, so when you start to look at the unemployment and then you start to look at forbearance and all forbearance is, is the ability to not pay your mortgage. So yeah, right. Right. So, so you, that was, you did not have to prove, prove hardship for the first part of that cares act. So at the end of September, you're going to see, all of that, you know, right now. So you had all these people right now, we're close to 3 million people that have not paid their mortgages uh, that are over 90 days delinquent. Okay. And then, so for the next six months, if they keep, uh, they have to prove, they have to prove hardship and then, then layer that over with, you know, the, the non-eviction thing and which Trump kind of started you know, back, he said, listen, no evictions through October. And then the CDC came out this week with, you know, we're going to kick that down at the end of the road. It, what it doesn't do though, Chris, is it doesn't allow them not to pay. It just says they can't be evicted. So it's still owed. Both the mortgage is still owed and the rent is still owed. And so I just believe that at some point the music stops, you know, like in the musical chairs, you know, it stops. And everybody's going to sit down and things are going to sort themselves out and hasn't had an opportunity to do that. And so that's what that video did. It said, listen, here are the numbers. Here's where it's heading. I personally know um, there's an, uh, I mean, look at all the bankruptcies. I mean, you could just go down the line from Macy's to Neiman Marcus to Sears to JC Penney's, and, you know, and you just could look and th th those are, while well, they're big names, people don't often associate them with people that work there, you know, and there's all these jobs that are being displaced on the restaurants and, you know, the service business and the travel business. And, and so I just see all the stuff really exposing um, itself next year. And, and so I do believe that there's will be a housing crash because right now there's uncertainty. So that we've never seen ever these kind of low inventory numbers. And that's why the market is hot. So what, like, think about it. If, if I'm sitting here and I don't know if, if I'm going back to work or where I'm going to go work or my financial certainty or uncertainty, or, you know, I, I'm, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not listing my house. You, you know, I'm, I'm going to sit here and, and just go, okay, let's see what happens here. Is, is my, is my employer going to hire me back? You know, am I going to, you know, come off a of furlough or, you know, how much savings do we have and how much equity do we have in our house and all that stuff. They're, everybody's calculating that right now. And, and so I believe that when all this, you know, starts to reopen up and we get this vaccine or, you know, we can go on and on about that as well. But, you know, um, then I think people are going to start coming back to normalcy next year, hopefully. And then you're going to really see the aftermath. And at that point, um, there, there's got to be massive, massive government stimulus to keep this thing going. And, um, and I believe at that point, Chris, the forbearance stuff has to end. They can't kick it down the road because they're paying somebody. If you hold my mortgage and I'm not paying you, you're in trouble. You know, that's income for you. So they don't calculate it all the way up. You know, when, when, a, rent, when a renter doesn't pay me, 
then I can't pay the bank. And then the bank puts me in default and then the bank owns the real estate. That's the cycle. Uh, you know, nobody's talking about that. So all that's happening. It's, it's not really being talked about a lot, but there's big companies that are missing payments, big ones, you know, that are all over the news. You know, I'm talking about hotel chains and things like that. And so, you know, they're just not paying. And then big retailers are saying, sorry, we're not paying. And, you know, and the landlords are sitting there going, well, we own the center and you're in it, but they're saying, well, we're closed. And so all that's happening. And so I think you're going to see a massive amount of inventory next year. And that inventory is going to jump up so high that, um, and the demand is going to be less because people are going to be um, hammered financially. Uh, that's when you'll start to see the beginning of, of a massive price drop. And you'll see properties that are going to go back to the banks and you're going to see all this migration these patterns moving all over the country. We're already seeing that, but you're going to see it, especially with remote work. So that's what that video is about. And it's gone viral, which has been great. You know, and I just, again, I just stick to the numbers, stick to the math. And I just said, this is what's happening right now. And I, um, you, you know, and, and then you try to do some kind of probability around that. And, but I think it's going to be really, really ugly next year. And, and, um, Again, thinking of real estate as, as many different asset classes, uh, you just mentioned there's regional patterns of disruption. Um, would it be fair to say that, that, that some cities might get in trouble around this? Um, you know, I've seen all the probably the same news you have where I saw a picture the other day. Sometimes it's a little picture that catches you with seven moving vans on one street in New York City, right? Just like people are just up and leaving. Yeah, would you think it's, it's uh, cities or? or yeah. So, yes. And so one of the great things about migration is that you could actually U-Haul, North American van lines, mm -hmm. even out-of-state driver's licenses. It's all data. So you can literally, you can literally, and, and U-Haul knows, of course, if, you know, if you're moving from Massachusetts to Arizona, that's data. Okay. All that's tracked. And so if you, you can go online and find this stuff, you can see where people are going. And I'm telling you, you know, those, those markets, whether it's New York, Chicago, Seattle, Portland, whatever it might be, those markets um, are definitely have a massive outflow happening. So there's a, there's a, um, you can go on the U S census. It actually shows you which States have had inflow versus outflow. It's just data and it's all tracked because when you go there, you buy a home or you rent, you, you know, you have a certain period of time to trade in your driver's license. And so they kind of know where you are. And so that, that, that is data that was already out there. And, and so you're going to see massive, massive outflow from what I would consider to be high density cities. You know, I think San Francisco is going to uh, really take a shot because, you know, like Twitter, Google, Salesforce, you know, these big companies that have thousands and thousands of employees said so you don't have to go back. You can now all work remotely. And so, you know, instead of 3,000 or 4,000 a month, they're, you know, they're, they're an hour away and it's 1,000, you know. And so, you know, there's all this stuff happening. It's, it's going to be interesting to see how it all settles out. And, uh, but without a doubt, Chris, you know, if everybody's talking about how hot these markets are, well, they're hot because people are going there, but what are they, nobody's talking about the ones, you know, they're coming from somewhere. So it's affecting something else somewhere else. And, um, you know, so that's all going to show up. I think, uh, you know, we're already seeing massive price adjustments in, in some markets. And again, back to the inventory issue, inventory is low right now because, you know, if, if I'm, I mean, you know, I'm hunkering down and, and I have a little bit of equity in my home, I'm not making a move. You know, I'm going to see, you know, how everything flows out unless I have a lot of cash and I can make a move and I, you know, then I'm, you know, I might do something like you've done, you know, and just go buy a farm and just see where this, this whole thing lands. Um, and which people are doing too, by the way, I mean, the, the sector that you're in, Oh my gosh, it's hot, 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 hot. And I'm up in Northern, I'm up in the Northern United States right now near Montana. I'm up in Northern Idaho right now. I mean, things are on fire right now in the rural sector, you know, for mm -hmm. these, uh, off the grid type stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's the hot sector right now. Um, again, I just I followed my spidey senses. You know, it was last uh, last summer, Evie and I we just saw. Uh, you know, we're living in a nice house. We you know we got a little riverfront place up in Greenfield, Mass. Got a garden, but all of a sudden we just said, 
I think we need a bigger, you know, we're going to need a bigger boat, you know, so we, <laughs> so off we went and, and uh, just, just, I feel so fortunate because if I was trying to look at that right now, uh, I would feel that scramble you talked about because it's so much competition. I would get that same urgency other people do, you know, and I've heard these horror stories of people, some of my followers saying they've been waiting, they've been waiting. And now all of a sudden it all feels out of reach because the places they want, there's a lot of demand for that. Um, do you think in this, in the real estate crash of 2021 that you're talking about, is that, uh, does that include these rural properties that are now hot or is that, uh, you, are you saying this is a tale of two worlds? It's the, both the places being left and the places being gone too. Well, I think, I don't, um, it's, it's hard to know what's going to happen from a rural standpoint at the moment. It looks to me like that could be fairly sustainable. Um, you know, I think the, you know, when we see a boom and bust in a market, you, there's usually a boom. So, you know, in a lot of the rural areas, there really weren't booms. Mm -hmm. And so now they're higher for sure, but there weren't real booms. And so, you know, if you go to all the major cities, you know, we, we saw five to 10% rent growth over the last 10 years. Okay. That I would say is a boom. You don't see that, you know, 20 miles out of town. You know, you know what I mean? And you don't see those kind of price adjustments on those homes 20 miles out of town. And so I think the, you got to pay attention to if you've just seen a boom, then you, you're going to have more of a bust. Could there be some adjustments? Sure, maybe. Uh, you, you know, again, but, but I think at the end of the day, when everything settles out, um, we'll know. But it's, real estate is very much a demand and supply business. So if there's a lot of people that are, that are going to a town that has very limited housing, then of course you're going to have a very, very robust market, you know, through all of this, um, you know, and, uh, you know, and so that's, that's just how it works, but everybody's definitely moving from something uh, to something else. And, um, and I think once, once they figure out where they want to be, I think a lot of people are really worried about, uh, you know, the, um, the virus. Um, you know, so there they have, you have that, you have others that aren't worried very much at all. Um, you, you know, and then you have people that are just getting out of the dense neighborhoods. There are people that don't have to work where they, you know, within a mile or two or three or four from where they were before and uh, they're making decisions. And so it's just going to be really interesting. I think, I think it's a wonderful time, you know, and, and um, it, you know, people can now be where they want to be. I think that's, uh, that's actually what it should be, you know, people should be where they want to be and they, sh they should not have housing, uh, you know, uh, as an obstacle for them. Yeah, well, it's uh, this Zoom thing is, is great, right? So we're Zooming yes. away happily right here. And, and uh, that's been something I think it's, it's hard for people to get their minds around. I've been talking about it a lot, which is that these changes that just happened are permanent. We don't know what all the impacts of that yet. There'll be things will emerge from that. But I don't think we're getting this thing where people rationalize, I have to live 60 miles outside of San Francisco to commute in through this horrible commute to be there face to face. If I cannot do that, I'm not going to do that anymore. And I, I like the Great Depression changed behaviors forever for some people. I think COVID has permanently shifted behaviors, including mine. I, I see myself, Ken, as possibly traveling a lot less, you know, sort of recreationally. Yeah. And, you know, it's just more thoughtful. It's just just a little different, you know, and to the extent we can do this now is fantastic. It really is. Yeah, uh, it is. And, and, you know, so that, in my opinion, was already starting. I mean, this technology, Chris, has been out there, mm -hmm. you know, and, and again, it's just, it's an accelerator, you, you know, and, and so, you know, we have every week, I have a 90 minute call with my leadership team and we do it all through Zoom. I haven't seen any of them since March. Even my partner, Ross, I haven't actually seen since February, you know, but, you know, we're, we're doing this every single day and, and our company is still moving along, you know, and, and I think a lot of companies are starting to figure that out that, you know, they don't necessarily need to go someplace physically. And that's really impacting the office market, you know, and I have some office, you know, I mean, a, a corporate office that has 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 square feet, you know. I, I still believe it looks to be like they're still going to have a corporate office, but maybe it's five, you know, mm -hmm. and they have some op, uh, conference rooms and, you know, places where people can come and go uh, to do meetings or, you know, when they want to get togethers. 
but it's very, very different. You know, they have that big 50,000 square foot footprint with your name on the building. I think those days are, are gone, honestly, you know, they're, they're not necessary. Yeah. Well, you certainly have your finger on, on the market and, and understanding uh, where all of this is uh, really going. I mean, one of the old saws that I grew up with is that, is that real estate is really a function of the jobs. So we've just seen tens of millions of people lose their jobs. They're coming back slowly. Um, and, you know, we're hoping that we don't have a big double dip recession, you know, that they're just throwing stimulus money to try and keep this whole thing from cracking up. But, but to me, Ken, the, the, real, the real engine of the country has always been small and medium sized businesses. That's where most of the hiring happens. Do you see that coming back or, is, or do you think there's a, another shoe to drop there in terms of how they're, you know, you just mentioned all this stuff about, you know, occupancy at, at gyms and restaurants being half, you know, those things were, were not, um, many of them are sort of marginally profitable at full capacity, right? I just don't even know how that's this works. Exactly what, that's exactly my point. It's interesting. I, you know, I, I, there's something that came out last week on Yelp. And um, I was like, you know, Yelp has no skin in the game, right? They basically rate businesses. And um, it, it essentially said that 33% of their restaurants are gone. Yelp. And I'm like, okay, so, and, and they project that 25% of the businesses, you know, these are all they do, you know, they have no skin in the game. They're not trying to sell anybody anything. They just basically are there for a business. And, um, and I just think that, you know, there's going to be a, a massive amount of uh, money lost as a result of those closures. But on the other side of it, to your point, there's going to be a tremendous opportunity also to, you know, to deal with um, new, new behaviors. So as an example, um, grocery anchored retail is doing very well. Anything with a grocery store in it is doing very well, obviously. So, you know, you still ha might have a karate studio next door and a, you know, maybe a yoga place or whatever. Okay, those centers are actually doing okay. But the ones that don't have that are not. Pretty common sense if you think about it, you know. And so you just got to. And, and the other, the other businesses that have done pretty well are the ones that had takeout windows, literally, you know, where you could drive through. Okay, mm -hmm. a lot of those have done pretty well because people don't want to go inside. And so you know, it's it's just gonna. So I think you're gonna see new design. I think you're gonna see a lot of things change, you know, around people's behaviors and and um, and you know. To your point, I mean, you're way ahead of the curve. You know, people are doing more at home together and they're doing it in smaller groups. I think that's wonderful. To get back to relationships, yeah. you know, and, and um, it's, it's been a great time for me. I, I mean, my, my kids got kicked out of school in March because of COVID. You know, they both came home and finished in their rooms, you know, which was super weird. But having them home was awesome. And, you know, we were on lockdown. But, man, I was having dinner with them every night. Uh, but I was, now they've gone back and my son said, it's horrible. You know, they basically, you can't go on campus and you, you know, all the, all the, all the dining halls are closed and, and the, they're, they're trying to do their best, but it's just, they're not really learning over Zoom. And so I think the student housing market and this, and the college, you know, institution of higher learning is under a massive, massive attack, not to mention the fact that their sports and all that stuff is, are shut down. So, you know, revenue has taken a massive hit on the, uh, you know, there too. And that has real estate implications, it, massive real estate implications, because you have, you had dorms that had two people in them and now they have one, as an example. And so, but a lot of those people got displaced uh, up to off campus housing, but they're going, why, am I, why would I get a rent? Why would I lease here and, and then zoom in, you know, a block from campus and, you know, you know, and cause they're, you know, the kids are there for obviously more than just that. And so I think, I, I think this is at the very beginning, Chris, and, and you know, colleges have only been in uh, session for a couple of weeks. So you're going to see, I think you're going to see some massive disruption. People are questioning the college, the cost of college education for uh, over zoom. And, you know, if, if, you know, if they're got student loans or they're, you know, or, or they're paying or a kid is paying for themselves and working two or three jobs, they're going, why would I do this? You know, why would I spend, you know, 15,000, $20,000 or, you know, even more all over the country um, for, you know, when I can actually do this at home. So my, my son's friends are saying, I'm not going to move to Tucson, Arizona 
to go to University of Arizona when I can just live in Phoenix, which is where I'm from, at my parents' house and do the same thing and, you know, and save a thousand dollars a month on rent. So, you know, there's all this stuff happening and, and I, I think it's going to really, really, really be disruptive and we're going to have a very interesting, you know, 14, 16 months ahead of us. Yeah. And I, I'm thinking, um, a lot of colleges and universities aren't going to survive this. Uh, and, uh, I don't want to pick on any one of them, but I was reading a Wall Street Journal article about Iowa and their, you know, their sports program's got $110 million revenue uh, sort of a situation, which is like gone, but they still have all these expenses, you know? And, um, uh, and so they decided out of 26 uh, competitive programs in their NCAA program, they're going to cut two of them. So they cut like men's swimming and women's diving or something, right? They saved $916,000 out of, out of a budget of 110 million, you know, which includes like, you know, big time coaches salaries and all that stuff for football and things. So, so I just, the, the adjustment process is going to be really hard for people to get their minds around this. One of the, one of the reasons I really like hanging out with you and the real estate guys and all the other crowd uh, around this, because, because everybody there's an entrepreneur and entrepreneurship is about adjusting quickly, right? You, you had a plan, didn't quite work and you either have to, you either fix it or, or you, you go down in flames, right? So that's just how I think everybody's gonna have to be just a lot more entrepreneurial. And I sort of raised, you know, that, that college is sort of like so stuck in its ways that all it could think yeah. to do was cut 916,000 out of a $110 million budget. And that was probably painful, right? And we're gonna have to be faster and quicker than that, aren't we? Well, right, uh, to, to your point, like I, I actually dug really into this as well. So I looked at Ohio State just because I was like, okay, because I don't know if you remember the student visa issue where the student visa issue basically said there's a there's a uh, con there was a condition in the student visa that said you can't so if, if if an international student comes over to the United States they can't take their classes online that was in the agreement. Mm -hmm. Well, Trump, you know, uh, reversed that just about a month ago very quietly. But that issue, just that one issue, um, there were I looked at Ohio State. There were 7,400 students that were international at Ohio State paying 40 grand. So it was like 300 million in change. And the Ohio State uh, football team brings in 500 million. So just those two things is 800 million, y you know, and, and that, that's not even counting the kids that are, you know, live in the United States um, that are saying, you know, uh, I don't think I want to move all the way to Ohio uh, and, and uh, just rent something nearby and take it over Zoom. So I actually think you're going to start to see pretty big layoffs and, you know, and we've already seen a little bit of it. I don't know if you, you've read, but uh, there are definitely schools that are already doing this and, and they're going to have to massively adjust their revenue model, um, you know, their value proposition model. And, and I think there could be some really good real estate implications around all this. You know, I really do. I would love to be able to pick up, you know, some real estate on college campuses because I think over the long haul, it'll correct, you know, and come back. But this could be a great time for a real estate investor to keep their eye out for that. Because whenever you have real estate exists for people, not the other way around. So, you know, if there's a lot of people, you know, do whatever, want to rent, then, you know, that's it. Or want to buy, then, you know, or buy something, you know, that's what it's for. And so you can't just stick a piece of real estate out there and hope people come. You know, you have to have, you have to watch the supply and demand of those things and then make sure that you're, you know, out in front of it. And this is certainly something that's reversing. You know, I think, uh, I think the, the, the you know, you know, those institutions, as you know, they slowly buy property and then all of a sudden they have city blocks. And, you know, I think, I think you're going to start to see that stuff on the market uh, in the next few years. Well, so what would you say to somebody who's, who's maybe been, been sitting uh, for a little while and thinking, you know, I'd like to get that place out in the country or maybe I should move or all that. Or would you advise them to wait and uh, wait, wait for something to blow up and watch where the dust is settling? Or would you want them to get out in front of that? I would. I would want them to start looking and get out in front of it now. And I, I think that, um, you know, at, to your point, not all real estate's on fire, you, mm -hmm. you know, and there are lots of, like, this, this is a big country and there's a lot of stuff happening all over. And, um, and so if you're really concerned about that over the long term, you know, there's amazing deals one mile from, or one hour from city centers all over the country. And, and you, you know, as you know, 
So as you get further and further up, generally you get better and better deals. And so if you're concerned about that, I wouldn't wait, you know, because, you know, in the city, it might be a million bucks, but all the way out, maybe it's a hundred grand. You know what I mean? It's just, it's, it's, it's inconsequential, uh, it, you know, from a lifestyle standpoint, it, you know, on, on, on what you want. And so, um, but there are definitely bubbles, you know, that are popping right now as, you know, it's already starting. You know, we're already seeing defaults. We're already, um, you know, I, I, I was watching the head of Starwood. Um, he did a great video on YouTube. And I, I can't remember his name, but, you know, the, you know, Starwood, they own all the big hotels around the world. Yep. And he said he thinks a third of the uh, hotels in New York City are, are not going to make it. So just as one example. And that is, <laughs> this is a very knowledgeable, smart guy. Yeah. And, and I'm like, man, you, you know, because people aren't going there, they're not paying those high dollars and you know, they need that money. And so those are, that's real, real estate that will be sitting there at some point owned by somebody is somebody else, a bank, you know, who knows? So, you know, that's happening all over the place. And I think that as you start to see that, um, you know, uh, you know, going out and, and doing something like, like you uh, have and just being more sustainable, more off the grid and a little more unplugged, I think is a, is a very, very good idea. Well, it feels right. It, it certainly, you know, ticks all my intuition buttons and it's a, uh, it's a uh, hard work, but it's the kind of work I love. So maybe it's not for everybody, but I, I really enjoy systems and figuring stuff out and doing things a little better and trying stuff. Um, you know, we've had some uh, really bright young interns sort of show up to help. And uh, all of them are a little bit surprised because I'm just like, slap something together as fast as you get. Really, shouldn't we do this right now? Just slap it together and then we'll figure out the better way to do it. I like, yeah. I'm a rapid prototyper, you know? And, and then, you know, once you figure it out, then you can invest a little more in, in uh, doing the fence well, exactly right. Well, that, that 12 acre uh, resort we have in Sedona, you know, we have a organic farm there. And I, I knew nothing, as you know, when we bought this thing, but I knew I could figure it out. And we had so many people that were clamoring to, to help work there because I, you know, I, I talked to the girl that we have working there for us right now. And she's like, this is my dream job. Mm -hmm. I go, really? She's like, oh, I've studied this. I da -da -da -da. And so she comes with all this knowledge. You know, we don't pay her a ton, but to her, she's like living in the best place on the planet. And she's providing food for, you know, for our guests. And, um, you know, so I'm learning from her. And so there's no shortage of people that are really smart that you know can help you navigate all this stuff. You don't have to know um, in the on the front end. Uh, you know, I mean, we're just normal guys. And, you know, we, I, I just reach out to people that are much smarter than me and surround myself with those people. And you know, and then and voila, you know, you look better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's a lot of people who are very interested in this lifestyle, and so that's for people who do have the capital. Um, I do think it's it's. Uh, I, maybe I shouldn't overstate this, but it feels like my responsibility, Ken, to, to share what I've got. And I, I, I bought this beautiful place with Evie and, and we don't feel like it's ours. It's kind of like we're, we're stewarding it or something. And we're trying to figure out how to, how to share it with more people. So for people who are really inspired by it, it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. So um, it's just, it's like, um, yeah, we're just here sharing it, you know? And, and my, only, my only, I have very simple criteria, whatever, whatever somebody does, I don't care what they do. If somebody could come and be a beekeeper or they want to start a garden or they want animals, I don't care. But my rule is you have to make it, you have to leave it better than you found it. Yeah, right. You know? I, I think that's, if, that's what you should do on every piece of real estate. I, I bought an amazing historical home here in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and just sold it actually two weeks ago. And, um, you know, I bought it in 2014 when the market was down and I, and I, I just brought it back to life and um, sold it, you know, uh, for uh, honestly a couple million more than I paid. And, um, you know, and, and I did that because I, again, to your point, I felt like, you know, I'm just, I'm, it was built in 1905. I'm just one owner, of, you know, that owned it for, you know, six years. And, um, you know, and now I'm passing it to the next owner and hopefully they take care of it as well. And that's how I look at real estate. You know, I, I look at it as, you know, if we really are just passing through, you know, and if, if we can make it better um, and enjoy it and, and um, not to get too beat up in the process, uh, you know, I don't know why you wouldn't consider it in the overall financial picture for yourself and which is what you're doing, you know, and, and that stock market scares me to death. 
it, you know, it just does. Uh, I'm just, uh, but I understand real estate. It's slow. It's dumb. You know, you can buy something, stick somebody, you can buy a vacant building and put somebody in it and it's worth more. You know, I know yep. that, <laughs> you know, that's just super simple. Um, which works for me, you know, <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's on that license plate of your car? <laughs> My Ferrari, uh, C student. That's, that's the license plate yeah. reads C student. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I was, man, I'll tell you, I really was. So, uh, yeah. Well, and thankfully so, because it, it led you to property management, it led you to where you are. So that's how life goes, right? You've, if you follow the yeses, you can get to where you need to be, right? So um, Yeah, yeah, it's, it's so true. And, you know, for me, I just learned the operations side. I was really blessed to be able to learn the operations side first. And so then when I started buying, I just could overlay, you know, all that experience. And I knew, I, I actually know before I'm going to buy something, how, you know, uh, I have a whole plan of, you know, how to, how to, how to re-engineer it and, and, and turn it into something more valuable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember hearing you talk about your process for that and it was very, um, uh, it's very scientific for a C student. I don't know. Very comprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I call it forced equity. You know, I, you know, I just think it's everywhere. I really do. It's exactly the house that I just mentioned to you. It's just, you know, on the water, great value, breathe some life into it and mm -hmm. sell it to the next person, you know? Uh, and I think, you know, I, I, that's how I see everything. I see that with businesses. You know, I, I, I started buying billboards by the way. Oh, and, really? uh, those, those would be great. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. I'll tell you, I, I'll tell you a short story. You love this. I got a piece of land. Um, it's like three acres had a billboard right in the middle and it, the billboard was making like five grand uh, a year. And uh, the land was only 300 grand or something. It's like a hundred thousand acres. So I said it to Ross, I go, Hey, I want the billboard. I don't care about the land. So, so uh, I, we called the billboard guy and I said, you know, cause it was on a big road. And so the billboard was just mismanaged. And I said, I asked him, I go, how much do you think you can get for that? He goes, probably 40, 50 grand a year, you know, with the right advertising. So I obviously put it into escrow. I put an easement around the billboard sold off the land for a little bit less than 300 you know so i was in the billboard for zero and now that thing's doing about 45 net a year <laughs> so, but it's a real estate play you know it's like so this is all i think about this is crazy i like you know i just look at stuff like you like entrepreneurial i was like how you know there's something wrong here and it was really the end of the day it was a great billboard along a great um uh road that had uh was wasn't even thought of as a use. It was actually looked at as a nuisance because the, the guy wanted to build some single families on there. And for me, I just wanted the billboard. And so, you, you know, people, it's, um, you know, making money and, 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 and doing deals is, 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 is in your mind. You know what I mean? It's what you see. It's what nobody else sees. Uh, and so that's just pure education. And so once you start to look at things that way, the money shows up, man. You know, obviously I didn't need an investor for that but the money shows up when you see things that are broken and that are in need of um, injection of money and sometimes you can spend too much sometimes you can overpay sometimes you buy in the wrong spot sometimes you know it's what i say calling it catching a falling knife you know mm -hmm. you don't want to you don't want to catch it while it's still falling you want to wait until it stops and um you know so uh but if you can learn how to do that and have a, a good team uh, you can really have an incredible life. I mean, as you know, I'm blessed. I fly all over the place and do deals and, and make money for ourselves and our investors. And I'm uh, healthy and happy. So, <laughs> so you win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've invested a lot of gold and silver for you guys and timber and all kinds of stuff. Good. Good. Yeah. Those, those, uh, the, at the tier one, two and three, right. You want a yeah. bunch of stuff at the bottom of the pyramid, nothing wrong with tier one, easy to understand, makes a lot of sense. Um, that's been my own play at this point. You know, the, the largest allocation of money that I've done in years has been into real estate and primarily productive, uh, farmland, timberland, you know, yeah. things like that. So just feels right. I can understand it. It makes sense. I don't understand how Apple is allegedly worth more than the collective companies in all of the uk <laughs> i don't i don't get that so yeah. i don't try um if i can't understand something i'm i'm, I'm done with it uh so i'm out right. of that i i agree with you I, I, real estate is not complicated 
It honestly is not. I mean, it's, you know, it, it seems unreachable for a lot of people, but once you understand it, there's a bunch of people that are getting their butts kicked other places that will give you money to do real estate deals. I'm telling you, you know, but you have to know it. You have to understand it. Um, you have to have a little experience. You have to have a good team. Um, and it does pay off for you. The real, the money uh, does attract to you when you, when, you know, when you have that kind of knowledge and it should, you know, that's exactly how the world works. People want to invest with us because, you know, you know, of all the things I just mentioned, all the things that we learn and the team that we have and, you know, and um, we have, you know, not every deal goes completely well, um, a lot do, but the point is, is, you know, we learn from that and, you know, we put really, really good teams around that. And, um, you know, there's no shortage of people trying to figure out how to make money on their money and not be in the bank because inflation's coming, man. Yeah, it, it, well, it has to, right? Trillions and trillions of printing and it's already here in the stock market. That's what I see people like, why is it going up? Like it's inflation, right? And eventually that inflation is going to leak out. And I think it's already, here. you know me, I, I'm, I'm such a curmudgeon, but but I, the government doesn't always tell us the truth. You know, they there's lies. Damn oh, really? <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know, I don't get out of the house as much as I used to because of COVID. But every time I go to the grocery store, I'm shocked now. Can, can, I can put my arms around two bags and, and about 300 bucks of stuff. It's just it's ridiculous now. Right. I so know. they can tell me that food inflation is one point eight percent, but I can tell you it's not right. You know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, and people have to be seeing that, you know, I think, you know, I think something to be careful of, uh, for, you know, coming up is I, I think the government's really going to go after, uh, real estate, uh, uh, you know, taxes. I, I think that that's low hanging fruit for them. You know, we are, uh, I don't know if you knew, but Nashville passed a 34% uh, property tax increase recently. And, um, you know, and you know, the, the, the governments are going to look, or things ta through tax to fund whatever they need to fund. And I think real estate is low hanging fruit. So I would, um, you know, let your listeners know that, that that's something that they should be considering, um, you, you know, and, and, you know, over the long haul. In fact, one of the reasons I sold my home here in Coeur d'Alene was the taxes went from 13,000 to 26,000 in um, uh, four years. Yeah, it's, it's such a great point. And I, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Mish, just escaped from Chicago. And uh, to, to your U-Haul story, he had to wait three weeks to get one. But they were, they were offering, if he wanted to go get one from some other place where they all were piled up and bring it back, he could get a great deal, right? So, um, so he had that experience. But I'm looking at places like Chicago, like that uh, university story where they can't quite figure out how to trim this massive budget. I think Chicago is going to be just a poster child for a place where they have all these government workers and services and they're going to, they want to keep all of them running. They've got great stories for why every single program is essential and people are fleeing. So the taxes go up on the remaining people and you just get in that tax death spiral. I, I think that's going to be playing out all over the place. So yeah, you really got it. When you're picking a place, consider the tax base uh, very, very carefully because um, yeah, a it's a big deal. Right. It's a big deal. It, it could sneak up on you. So, you know, as you're looking, make sure, you know, that, um, you, you know, you're really in tune with that because the, the assessors can, you know, you can buy something and a year later, um, you know, you can be battling. I, I literally hired an attorney every single year <laughs> to appeal it. And every single year they're, they basically, sorry, dude, <laughs> like, you know, uh, and so it wasn't the primary reason I sold. Yeah. But, but um, I was certainly frustrated with the fact that my taxes doubled, um, you know, in that period of time. And because the, that's a big part of revenue for a growing city. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, uh, I told you I was looking two states, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, very different tax strategies. New Hampshire, no income tax, no sales tax, but it all comes out of property tax. And that weighed kind of heavily. And, and when I said that there weren't that many places that we were interested in, I'll tell you what was all over the place in New Hampshire were McMansions. Uh, you know, people had taken a little two, three, four acre thing, put this big six, 7,000 square foot house on it. Now it's got 20 to $25,000 yearly tax bill. And so when you, when you sort of pencil that in and you go, do I really want to pay a quarter million dollars in property taxes every 10 years? Or would I have a better use for that money? You know, 
It, no, it's, yeah, I, right. You, yeah, I mean, if the, most people don't think about that, you know, that's a couple grand a month. You know, I mean, that could be a payment on a piece of land. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I mean, just that. Like, you, you know, it's just, you know, so you really got to take a look at all that. That, that I, think, I think property taxes are low-hanging fruit for governments moving forward to pay for a lot of what we're seeing right now. It has to be. You know, we're going to get, as a landlord, I, I know that that's coming. But one of the things that we're looking at um, is, you know, where are the, the you know, property tax friendly states, you know, because I think and so I think as people start to um, move around, you know, they're looking at safety issues, of course, mm -hmm. they're looking at affordability issues, of course, and they're looking at weather amongst, you know, other things. And so those are things I think if you can look at those spots. I think you're going to see migration patterns to those areas as people, you know, try to regroup. You know, uh, I would, you know, I, I certainly would. I, I would try to figure out how, do I, how can I get my living expenses down and, and, you know, reinvent myself, whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, and that goes back to, you know, what we were talking about with you earlier. And you, you already did that. Not that you needed to, but you, were, you, you did it for other reasons. To, but the point is, I think a lot of people are going to start to look at that now. And, and you know, because housing is a massive expense. And for for an individual, and property taxes, you know, part of that, not just the not just the debt payment. Yep. And now that you can be anything from anywhere with Zoom uh, technology and things like that, um, it really feels to me like this is a great period of reinvention. It, it's honestly, Ken, why I'm not all that pessimistic. You know, I, I think there's some hard times coming. I'm really glad I'm not a airline pilot or a mechanic uh, or something like that. And one of these industries is just trashed. Uh, you know, I'm glad I'm not really banking on uh, cruise industry, you know, kind of earnings and all that. But, but for everything that's going away, there's a whole new set of things that are starting up. And, and that's where the entrepreneurial mindset's just got to come in because there's lots of stuff going on out there now that, that, you know, at least for myself, I just see opportunity everywhere right now. And I can't possibly get to it all right now. Um, well, there is. With, with disruption there's opportunity and, and it's interesting. I, I actually was Googling, it's been about a few weeks ago, just what businesses started during recessions, you know, and um, there's so many, you know, I mean, Airbnb is a great example, you know, and, and Uber, you know, they, you know, they started during recessions. And, and so there's, now those are big names now, but they weren't when they started. And so there's a lot of cool stuff happening. My, I have a good friend that's in the pet business, and, um, you know, it was okay. It was pretty good. But then with COVID, he's like, all the shelters ran out of pets because everybody went out and got pets. And that's a good thing. He said, you know, but so one of his businesses is dog crates. And he's like, he, I, I, he goes, I can't keep up, you know? And so there's, like you said, there's, there's the, another side of, you know, you always hear about, you know, the things that are bad, but there's uh, another side of it too that uh, there are businesses that are gonna do very, very, very well. And as, as um, Buckminster Fuller, as you know, we study him, he says, don't, you know, um, let you, you use the forces with the, you know, use the momentum and, and just pay attention to the momentum and use the forces to your benefit. And, and that's all you have to do. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people are super resistant, you know, they're trying to hold on to old behavior, old biases, old habits. And, um, and you just got to step back and say, okay, you know, what could happen? What is the possibility that's going to happen here? Like on the college campuses, as an example, and, or on some of these big cities. And what, what is that actually going to do? And what are the opportunities there? You know, and, and there's a lot of money to be made in the next three to five years, you know. And the fact that people are, are really realizing, I think, how, how thin their um, paychecks and their, their jobs and, you, you know, and, and um, you, you know, maybe even their savings. Um, hopefully it's a wake up call for a lot of people and, and they don't get hurt too badly and they can really reinvent themselves going forward and, um, and do exactly what, you know, you and I have been talking about the whole time is, is you need to have multiple sources of income and you need to be unplugged from the grid just a little bit um, you know, not as some conspiracy theorists, but just 
just enough to know that, you know, you've got buckets of money coming in and that you are safe and you're not relying on one source. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's, I think, uh, hopefully a wake up call for a lot of folks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so in in closing here, I'd I'd love to, I mean, thank you so much for this conversation. Yeah, of course. And and you are, you, you are, you're the brightest C student I know by far. <laughs> you, no, you, you are, you are, you are very smart in your ways. Ken. you, you've always got, you know, you're skating to where that puck is going to be. And, and there's a lot to learn from that. And, but really what it comes down to has been, it's just, you're a hard worker and you're diligent and you're thoughtful and you're conscientious. And, and if you carry those attributes with you, I think people will be fine. Um, you know, if they could, they could model that. So you've got this uh, video out. How can people find it? So you can find it on, uh, we've got a Ken um, is our website, you know, and we have, uh, it's all free videos and, you know, forms and stuff. If, if uh, people are in the real estate business, you have that, but then the, the, the YouTube uh, is just uh, Ken McElroy and, you know, just go subscribe and, um, I'm having a blast it, and I'm getting my, uh, my ideas from the, from the people that are joining, you know, uh, cause you know, I'm just one guy trying to figure out what everybody wants to hear. And then like you, I just dig into it and try to figure it out. And I, I have lots of network and resources around all that. And so I've been trying to deliver videos that are meaningful to people, um, that could help them through, through all this. So it's been great. Uh, so Ken is, is the spot. Great. We'll have that link right below this, of course, and uh, direct people there and, and fantastic video. And, and I didn't want to go through all the highlights of it because, you know, um, it, people should go watch that. Uh, it's really that good. And uh, everybody, especially if you're considering, and I know a lot of you are, what are you going to do about your living situation? Are you going to change that? It's something you really need to go watch and understand from one of the masters and somebody who's been there, done that, um, and not his first rodeo. So with all of that said, uh, Ken, thank you so much for your time today, and it's just been a real pleasure. And I, I wish we didn't have COVID because I, I would love to love to hang out with you again because it's. Always- I know. Well, I, I tell you what, let's get together. Uh, let's let's zoom after this and just have some more of this chat. I love your mind and how the way it thinks. It just thinks so differently than mine, and I'm always trying to change my opinion. So I would love to get into <laughs> some more dialogue with you and Adam. Well, absolutely. Let's do that. So until then, uh, thanks very much for today. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, we'll be back Cheers, next everybody. Week.